Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit is now open according to law. God save the United States and this honorable court. Please be seated. This is the final day of uh, the session here in this courtroom for this panel this week. Welcome the advocates uh, to who aren't bringing up the rear. They are bringing the important cases to us here on the final day. We appreciate your efforts uh, in preparing, and we are trying to prepare as well. Uh, a few problems, I suppose, have occurred during earlier arguments this week. Being able to hear everything clearly both directions, certainly feel free to let us know if you're not quite hearing us. That barrier uh, does prevent some, present some problems to being able to be understood, but I think we've managed well through all of them. Judge Higginbotham's on looking after all of us back uh, where he is on his, his, uh, in his chambers. So uh, we are ready to proceed. First case of the morning is Turner Charles Levy versus Cincinnati Insurance Company. Looks like Mr. Allen gets to go first. May it please the court. I appear today on behalf of the Turner group of plaintiffs, the appellants in this case, and Mr. Charles Levy as the pro uh, projected or proposed uh, intervener. We're here today, your honors, because Cincinnati put the cart before the horse in two important ways. First, they put the adversarial trial cart before the judgment creditor horse with respect to um, Hamill. And second, they put the duty to indemnify cart before the duty to defend horse in terms of their ruling that uh, as a matter of law, there was no duty to indemnify on the part of Cincinnati. We're here seeking two things primarily. <clears throat> First, we're seeking a reversal of the summary judgment uh, rendered by the district court against uh, the Turner Group. Second, actually we're seeking three things. Second, we're seeking, in essence, an order uh, in uh, granting the motion for partial summary judgment that we filed that was denied by the district court. And third, we're seeking a remand of the rest of the case to, back to the district court with instructions for the district court to follow the mandates of the Texas Supreme Court case in um, Great American Insurance Company versus Hamill. The district court erred primarily two ways. First, it erred in saying that um, judgment creditors need to have an adversarial trial. They have to be judgment creditors by virtue of an adversarial trial as opposed to a non-adversarial judgment creditor uh, in order to have standing to pursue the insurance company Cincinnati. And then second, they equated pleadings as actual facts in making their determination that the duty, that Cincinnati owed no duty to indemnify. In other words, the uh, decision on the duty to indemnify was made totally on allegations and pleadings and not actual facts. The Turner Group has, to get here to this honorable court, has undertaken a long, arduous road. Uh, the Turner Group and other students at the Waco ATI uh, Trade School sued the series of ATI defendants for misrepresentations, improper recruiting, and things other really under other Deceptive Trade Practices Act. Cincinnati agreed to defend. They uh, took the case, they hired the Fanning Harper firm who represents them in the coverage case as well as uh, Bailey Cavalieri, and uh, they defended the uh, case uh, down in Waco, and then about eight, 10 months into it, no change of pleadings, no declaratory judgment. They just stumbled upon an earlier filed suit against some of the, but not all, some but not all of the ATI defendants 
in dallas and they denied coverage based so we understand your your position on the acorn is rule and that cincinnati improperly withdrew from representation what effect does that have today if you are right on the issues before us that they didn't follow through and we don't have a duty to defend issue anymore that that lit that piece of the litigation is over so how does it affect what we have to resolve today well it's it's once again it's putting the horse before the cart as opposed to the cart before the horse we have an arrangement now going down the road let's not worry about things being out of order initially how does it affect the issue before us well if what it does is it once a breach of the duty to defend is established cincinnati then comes in under the hamill trial and has to defend the liability and uh the damages alleged against him in the hamill trial in other words hamill is what allows us to satisfy the adversarial trial requirement of the you know going back to uh block going back the gandy go through the whole sequence of it and you had situations where particularly in gandy uh, you know, Gandhi is the, basically the birthplace of the adversarial trial requirement. Gandhi took issue with the uh, agreed judgment in block and said, we're not going to bind an insurance company based on anything other than a legitimate adversarial trial. Well, even if the district judge was incorrect on the first part of his ruling that you needed either an adversarial judgment or an assignment, even if that is incorrect, and that the default or the, uh, the judgment that you do have non-adversarial at least gives you standing to go to avoid the direct action rule and, and, and sue the Cincinnati Insurance Company. Wouldn't the district judge, and, and you have it as a separate issue, but procedurally wouldn't it be proper if in fact there's no genuine dispute or material fact for the district judge to decide the coverage issue? as he did, so long as there are no genuine factual disputes. Well, the, the, eventually we will have to get to the, the coverage. Not issue. eventually. That issue was before him. Judge Albright decided both that you had no standing and then decided in an abundance of caution or some phrase like that, the coverage. And he said there's no coverage. What is improper about that, regardless of whether there's a breach of the duty to, in, to defend, what is improper about once that issue is teed up, uh, beside, instead of having a trial, the way you would any other case, you decide if there are any genuine disputes, material fact, to try. Judge Albright decided there weren't. Well, you'd have to, you'd have to do it on facts. You couldn't do it on allegations. Well, that's your point. That's what I'm just saying that seems to me the central issue before us today and not anything about whether there's a breach of the duty to defend and potentially not whether there's standing but but perhaps Cincinnati is right and Judge Albright was right on that but uh, they'll have to convince me uh, but isn't that why was there not enough uh, factual information in front of the district judge to resolve this on summary judgment allegations and pleadings do not constitute facts the duty to de indemnify is determined by the actual facts the duty to defend is determined by allegations and pleadings without reference to the truth or false, falsity, veracity of them. What but are with the disputed facts? Pardon me? What are disputed facts? Dispute, well, that, they're, that it's interrelated, uh, that it's interrelated, that it's prior knowledge. There's, uh, there's nothing in these uh, pleadings, for example, nothing in the pl pleadings that equates uh, the Waco lawsuit with the earlier filed Dallas lawsuit. And of course, the, uh, the uh, um, cases that, that Cincinnati relies on, it's the allegations in the petition, I, I believe it's Reeves, and I believe it's um, uh, King Chapman in particular, where they had a situation where in King Chapman, there was an exclusion that said nothing about your 2001 divorce. He then goes and breaches uh, the divorce decree, and in 2006, he gets sued for breaches of the 2001 divorce decree. And it was a pretty easy call for the court under the, under the eight corner rule. But uh, if, if, if we, can, we can certainly go into a proceeding where we uh, take on 
interrelated wrongful acts, for example, as uh, uh, on a proper record, aside from uh, just comparing to pleadings. Pleadings are not, allegations and pleadings are not facts. You, the duty to defend de de uh, depends on the actual facts. And in fact, if you read uh, both of Judge Albright's opinions, it almost is, he takes the position that, well, you might be right under the duty to defend uh, and the anti-extrinsic evidence and the uh, no exceptions to the extrinsic evidence rule. Uh, but uh, I'm going to, I don't have to deal with the duty to defend because I'm going to jump over it. I'm going to put the cart before the horse and rule on the duty to indemnify solely on allegations and pleadings. Uh, nothing else. There's no, no facts out there what's, whatsoever that would support a denial of the duty to indemnify. The actual facts have not been uh, presented. So uh, put us in the situation where we go through all this long, they deny defense, they deny defense without seeking a declaratory judgment, there's no pleading amendment, they just out of the blue deny defense and then ATI goes bankrupt, okay? Took us years, five years in order to get the stay lifted that allowed us to pursue Hamill to a T. Nothing that we have done is untoward. There is no gamesmanship. We are not trying to distort the litigation process at all. All we're trying to do is use the remedy afforded by Hamill so that we can prove ATI's liability and our damages in an adversarial trial, just as Justin Lehr uh, Lehrman of the Texas Supreme Court said. This procedure that we adopt today will allow judgment creditors and assinees, uh, I don't think there's really any uh, valid distinction between judgment creditors and assinees where something's magical about an assinee that allows them to pursue the insurance company directly, but a judgment creditor who um, doesn't get their judgment as a result of an adversarial trial, again, cart before the horse, if we could have gotten ATI's liability and our damages proved in an adversarial trial at any point in time, we would have done so. Are there any adversarial proceedings in the bankruptcy at this time or in the past since it's been filed? No. Any, any creditors? No. In fact, you go to the, uh, like, take the Landmark case, which is a case that they heavily rely on, the case that Judge Albright heavily relied on. Uh, the issue in uh, Landmark was whether a proceeding in the bankruptcy court actually uh, passed muster under the adversarial re uh, trial requirement, and it was held no. In fact, the claimant in Landmark, the claimant in CBX, they weren't coming to court like we are and saying, look, we're burying our souls. We have a huge amount of insurance and we have been uh, damaged and our suit has been thrown off kilter. All we want to do is invoke the remedy that the uh, unanimous Texas Supreme Court afforded in Hamill so that we can uh, prove their liability, prove our damages, as Justice Learman said. They have the, the burden on the plaintiff is fair. The insurance company doesn't get to get away with something that's their own making. In other words, they created the problem. Uh, it deals with, uh, they don't get to go scot-free when they created the problem in the first place. And Justice uh, Learman also uh, pointed out that um, in the Hamill trial, the insur insurance company will be properly motivated to make sure that everything's fair and everything is on the up and up. We, you deal with cases like Block, you deal with cases like Gandhi, uh, gamesmanship, I mean Gandhi in particular. Our facts. What, what you'd like to do then is to retry the case that you have the default judgment on you want to try it again with 
at a, someone sitting at the opposing table and offering opposition. Isn't that what you yes, want under Hamilton? Absolutely, absolutely. In other words, it's not the de, uh, it's not the adversarial trial requirement that bestows standing on the Turner Group. It's the default judgment. How are we going to access that? Uh, one way is as a judgment creditor. So we go in, and one way to become a judgment creditor is to take a default judgment. It took a, it took five years. Uh, Cincinnati and the other insurance companies all opposed strenuously the attempt to get the stay lifted so that we could bring this particular suit against ATI uh, in Waco and take the default judgment. But yes, it is the, it is the default judgment at, that gives rise to the judgment creditor status. It gives rise to our standing to bring, pursue them directly. It's not the adversarial it's towel. It's the obstacle to recovering against Cincinnati because it's not an adversarial judgment. Is it's totally it? circular. It's totally circular. In other words, uh, you can't pursue Cincinnati because your judgment was not the result of an adversarial trial, even though you are a judgment creditor, albeit by default. But then the only reason why we would go ahead and refile the lawsuit, you have to go ahead and refile it and serve it. And I mean, I'm trying to understand the mechanics of how yeah. you how you plan on getting where you say you need to be? Oh no, uh, we, well, got, we got Cincinnati's here in in appearance. Well, it's res judicata because it's, you already have a default judgment. Well, the default judgment is uh, it, well, it has no collateral estoppel um, value to it whatsoever. So we have facts to prove. We've got uh, it, it's the it's the default judgment that gives us the standing. It's not the adversarial trial. In other words, uh, the the method that they propose, and I see my time's up. Uh, well, finish. I think you're still responding to Judge Englehart. If you are still responding, if you want to wrap that up. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, well, uh, in uh, uh, repeating myself, it is not the adversarial trial that gives state rise to standing. It's the default judgment, which then leads in to the proceeding the uh, that they adopted today. In other words, a brand new proceeding that came out in 2017. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is James Young, Counsel for. Pelly Cincinnati Insurance Company. Sorry, what is your name? Uh, James Young. Oh, I didn't quite hear that. James Young is what this said, and keep going. May it please the court, opposing counsel. The three main issues, um, two of which were addressed in Mr. Allen's opening argument, um, any, which, any one of these issues is dispositive in favor of Cincinnati Insurance Company. Uh, to reverse the district court, this court will have to decide all three issues in favor of appellants. And the first issue is standing. Uh, Cincinnati Insurance Company maintains um, that there is no standing by a non-adversarial judgment creditor. And that's what the Texas Supreme Court has talked about, and that's what the landmark case directly addresses. Uh, the second issue is the coverage issue, whether the policy provides the coverage that they actually seek. Um, it does not. This was a claim made prior to the policy period um, for that reason, it's outside the basic scope of coverage and is barred by the prior and pending litigation exclusion. And then the final issue is the release, these claims that they seek to stand, that appellants seek to assert in the shoes of the judgment debtor, the actual insured, have already been released. Now, I want to talk first, actually, about the coverage issue, though. Uh, Judge Southwick, you addressed this um, much. I may have caught your attention that I said I thought that was a key issue and perhaps not standing, so I understand why you were raising that. Um, I mean, it, it is concerning to me that uh, perhaps Judge Albright didn't quite have enough in front of him yet. Did he? He did. Um, and you alluded to this um, uh, earlier. Uh, the, the relevant inquiry, if we look at the policy language, uh, the, the inquiry is whether or not the Harper lawsuit and the Bartlett lawsuit were based upon or rising out of the same or interrelated wrongful acts. And wrongful acts are defined as any actual or alleged error, misstatement, misleading statement, and so forth. Moreover, 
The prior and pending litigation exclusion excludes coverage for claims based upon arising out of, in consequence of, or in any way involving any prior and or pending litigation as of December 30th, 2010, or any fact, circumstance, and so forth underlying or alleged in such litigation. The allegations are the pertinent facts. The allegations are what are examined to determine whether these policy provisions are triggered. And to your point, Judge Southwick, what would be the facts here that we would determine that would justify putting off this determination of coverage? What would that record look like? Well, let me answer your question since you're asking me, counsel. In Judge Albright's opinion, he says the plaintiffs say the facts arise from the fact that it's different schools, different students, different teachers, different curricula. The suits involve all these different things. But then the court goes on to accept your argument. There were no pending, well, let me take that back. So you're saying nothing under the policy would make the facts that he wants to try relevant in saying one way or the other whether these claims are related? That's correct. The question under the policy turns on what are the allegations in these lawsuits. And when we dive into this even just a little bit, it makes sense why. Appellants are here asking this court to require Cincinnati Insurance Company to go back to district court and litigate the underlying case. Presumably, those facts that will be established in that adversarial trial are what they're referring to when they say the facts are relevant. But it does seem to me that, I mean, my point to him, and I'll make it to you as well, certainly you don't have a trial if something can be resolved on summary judgment. And so you might even have dueling, but at least Cincinnati would file a motion for summary judgment, say here are all the facts and there are no disputes to this. They could indicate that, in fact, there are relevant facts that are disputed and the district judge would decide. But I think your point is he's already decided that, even though not quite in that procedural context. Yes, Your Honor. The coverage issue was ripe. It was decided. To your point, there is no duty to defend issue anymore. There's no ongoing lawsuit. There is no insured to defend at this point. They are defunct. The question and what appellants seek from this court and what they sought from the district court below is its coverage for their default judgment or a relitigation thereof. That's a question of indemnification, not of defense. And to my earlier point about the record, if the relevant inquiry is whether or not the allegations in the Bartlett lawsuit petition are actually true, then by extension to analyze this relatedness issue, not only would Cincinnati Insurance have to try the Bartlett lawsuit, it would have to try the Harper lawsuit as well. So you can see when we start working through this framework, it gets entirely unwieldy and entirely inefficient. And it's, of course, contrary to the policy language itself, which, again, relies on allegations. Let me get to the issue of standing, which certainly Judge Albright accepted your view. Hamill is an assignment case, so you don't just have a non-adversarial judgment. You actually have an assignment. What is the best case supporting your position that actually has all the components that we have here? No assignment, no adversarial judgment. Well, that would be the Landmark case, Your Honor. It's directly on point. I don't know about Landmark, but no Texas Supreme Court case. Well, as far as the facts that we're here on today, the Landmark facts are almost perfectly analogous to what we've got. Now, from the Texas Supreme Court, there is case law that was relied on in Landmark that is directly applicable, and that would be the Essex opinion in which, in 2014, the Texas Supreme Court held a judgment creditor does not have standing unless the tortfeasor's liability has been fully determined. And then, in 2017, subsequently, in Hamill, the court reaffirmed its finding in Gandy, or its holding in Gandy, that a non-adversarial judgment determines nothing. It is not binding. It is not admissible into evidence against an insurer. So when you take those together, an adversarial judgment is required for the standing of a judgment creditor, and that's exactly what Landmark did. 
And to address a point appellants made on their opening argument, Landmark did involve bankruptcy. But it was not that the judgment creditor in that case obtained an adversarial judgment through bankruptcy, through an adversarial proceeding, for example. That wasn't why the court disregarded it as non-adversarial. The reason was there was a settlement agreement reached prior to that judgment in the bankruptcy proceeding that removed the insured's incentive to defend. It removed their incentive to oppose. That was the problem with Landmark. It wasn't just that an adversary proceeding in a bankruptcy cannot constitute an adversarial judgment. And that's exactly what we contend appellants should have done here. They come here and they did this in the briefs and they came to the district court and they come to this court and talk about how they had no opportunity to obtain an adversarial judgment. That's just simply not the case. They filed their lawsuit. The bankruptcy was filed. They, like every other creditor, received notice. And then we trust the bankruptcy process. That's the process that's in place to gather the assets of the bankruptcy estate and then dole them out. Appellants didn't participate in that process. They didn't make a claim. Cincinnati did participate in the process. The trustee brought the same coverage action that appellants here seek to stand in their shoes to assert and settled it with Cincinnati Insurance Company. That's the release issue. There was no objection from the appellants. The court blessed the settlement agreement, the bankruptcy court, found it was in good faith and fair and reasonable. So Cincinnati participated in that process. Appellants did not and should not now be heard to complain that they didn't have an opportunity to. Did they have an opportunity to file a claim in the bankruptcy of ATI? They did. They received notice like every other creditor. And some of the former students of ATI did participate, but not these appellants. And their attorney, Jay English, did appear in that case on their behalf. On the standing issue, the landmark case, as mentioned, that is the most directly applicable case that we have. It addressed this exact same issue, and appellants have no answer for it. Appellants have no response other than, well, in landmark, the judgment creditors contended that their judgment was adversarial, whereas we admit that ours is not. But that doesn't affect the central holding of whether or not a non-adversarial judgment confers standing. In the words of the landmark court, judgment creditor does not have a valid claim as a judgment creditor because the judgments upon which it relies did not occur as the result of a fully adversarial trial under the authority of Hamill and Gandy. Let me ask you this, and I'm sure, well, I hope opposing counsel will respond as well, at least just posing it for myself and not this panel. It seems to me there is no Texas Supreme Court case directly on point. Does a non-adversarial judgment at least give standing to start the Hamill process? You have landmark, you have Essex, you have a landmark's effort to bring together Texas Supreme Court law to say how this is supposed to work. Should we certify this question to the Texas Supreme Court? No, Your Honor, and here's why. The certification is for questions that are just that, that are in question. Here there is no question. There is no conflicting authority. The only authority that appellants assert entitles them to a Hamill trial. Hamill was trying to bring sense out of a variety of authorities, Gandy maybe being the most significant one, that it was trying to line up better perhaps with prior precedent. So I see Hamill, you would know better, but I see Hamill as a new articulation of the rules of the road for the sorts of cases that we're talking about. But it did not deal with a non-assignment 
non-adversarial judgment? And does a judgment creditor, insignificant judgment creditor, a creditor of an insignificant judgment is what I'm trying to say, does that entity, does that person have standing is, is seem to me a, a, the question on, on uh, whether the case can be cut off at the first step as you are suggesting that it can. But I know you're going to argue it's all settled well enough. Uh, I don't know why you even ask. Well, Your Honor, um, under Fifth Circuit precedent, um, the Fifth Circuit holds that although we are not bound by state appellate court decisions, we will not disregard them unless we are convinced by other persuasive data that the highest court of the state would decide otherwise. Um, here, there is a court of appeals decision directly on point that will be landmark. And that cites two lines of Texas Supreme Court cases in direct support. There is no persuasive data to suggest otherwise. Uh, rather, Essex and Angus and Hamill and Gandy all support and the, the decision in Landmark and support Cincinnati Insurance Company's position here as well. So I, no, I don't, I don't think certification is necessary. Um, on top of that, there is no contrary case law. There is no case saying Landmark was incorrectly decided. There is no, um, no outlier case that suggests otherwise. Uh, the only cases uh, that even speak to standing of a non-adversarial judgment creditor that appellants cite are P.G. Bell, Finney v. Ohio Casualty, and Huntington. And these cases were first cited uh, in the reply brief. They were not cited to the district court. They were not cited on the opening brief. And for good reason, because Finney v. Ohio Casualty and P.G. Bell both predated Gandy and the, courts, the Texas Supreme Court's proclamation that non-adversarial judgments have no effect on insurers. In uh, Huntington, the, the other case, that involved a judgment creditor who also held an assignment. Um, and in any event, when discussing the, the uh, issue of the judgment creditor, the, the court made no discussion of, uh, of Gandy or its effect on the analysis. So in other words, appellants come here asserting standing and asserting this is clear Texas law, but they're unable to cite a single case that allows a judgment creditor holding a non-adversarial judgment without an assignment to do exactly what they're asking to do. The only case law directly on point is landmark, which holds contrary, and the Texas Supreme Court opinions on which it relies, which undermine the position as well. What's the writ history on landmark? I vaguely re remember that depending on what Supreme Court says on a writ uh, has different impacts. Do we have any writ history on landmark? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I, I, I think I got your question. Um, the, uh, the landmark case, uh, it, was in, it was decided two months after Hamill, um, and the court cited extensively to Hamill, um, and obviously decided the, what it decided. It went back down to the trial court, um, and was, uh, let me back up a second. In the 2017 opinion, the court mentioned. Make sure you're answering my question. When I say written history, I'm saying was further review by the Supreme Court sought after the second landmark decision, and what did the Supreme Court do with that request? After the 2021 decision? The second, whatever year that was, 2021. Um, Your Honor, I do not know um, whether. I forgot it was that recent, so even if it writ was requested, it may not have been ruled on yet. But after the first landmark, it was just a remand, no effort to go to the Texas Supreme Court, I suppose. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. So in, in that the answers my question. In the 2017 landmark decision, um, the court really highlights the, important of a, of the importance of an assignment to confer standing. Because the, in that case, on appeal, the judgment creditor averred that had, it had now gotten an assignment from the insured, and so that would confer standing. The court acknowledged that, um, but said it wasn't in the record, so they kicked it back down to the district court. Then when it came back up on appeal in, earlier this year, the, um, the uh, judgment creditor now had an assignment, and the Court of Appeals held that that cured the standing issue and allowed them to proceed. It's not the case that we have an assignment here. We, we don't. There is no dispute about that. Um, and I, I want to circle back real quick to Hamill. Um, in the briefs, in the argument. So let me ask you about sure. Hamill. The assignment isn't what gives the stand. I know there's some talk in the briefing about 
the assignment being part of the facts of that case but which we don't have in this case but that's not what gives standing is it under hamel or my misreading that that's exactly what gives standing under hamel um and well it's the adversarial proceeding it's the adversarial judgment creditor status that gives standing or am i misreading hamel I, i'll go back and read it again if you tell me that the assignment is the trigger to standing so there well there's two issues there um one a stand an assignment does confer standing um an adversarial judgment does confer standing not adversarial judge, judgment does not um in hamel standing wasn't an issue at all uh the, as appellants admit standing is not discussed whatsoever um yet appellants rely so heavily on hamel uh, to make their standing argument and at the same time they they mentioned in their briefs and they mentioned an argument um, that Hamill's irrelevant to the standing inquiry. So then why are we talking so much about Hamill? Why are we talking about whether they, what difference does it make if they're a judgment creditor um, or an assignee? Why did much of the briefing, the bulk of it is dedicated to this issue? So why are we talking about it if it's so clear cut? Um, it, and why are they relying on a case that simply doesn't Maybe that's discuss a better issue? way of phrasing the question I was asking about, about in the facts of the Hamill case, uh, standing is based upon the assignment of the claim, the unliquidated claim. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, the court did not directly address the standing issue, but yes, and they analyzed over several paragraphs the validity of that assignment. The only reference to judgment creditors and Hamill's in passing and always coupled with judgment creditors and assignees. That's part of the statute, though. I mean, it wasn't material in Hamill, but it's material today in this case. You're right. It, is, it was not material in Hamill because uh, there was an assignment that conferred standing, and the standing issue wasn't even presented to the court, uh, nor was it decided. Counsel, let me ask you a question. I would like to go back to the bankruptcy proceeding. Um, this company went into bankruptcy. The trustee in bankruptcy then, of course, um, <clears throat> represented that company, and, and then and was it, it was insured. Um, by your company. Now, at that juncture, um, the uh, bankrupt proceeding works. Uh, it's going to determine the, uh, the trustees going to see all the claims that the company had. Um, uh, what is the effect, if any, upon the various claimants? I assume that they were people who filed claims in the bankruptcy court in the normal procedure are going to benefit from the, the recoveries made by the trustee. And you entered into negotiations with the trustee. Walk me through that for you. What happened here? Um, I apologize, Your Honor. You, you broke up a bit, and I don't think I got your full question. I know it's about the bankruptcy proceeding. Um... We, we have some difficulties uh, with the system, unfortunately. Let's try again. Hmm. I, wanted to, I want to go back to the basics here. Uh, you have a company that goes into bankruptcy, trustee in bankruptcy appointed, and he's going to pursue various claims they have, including any insurance against uh, that are there, the benefit of creditors, et cetera. What happened in that? Uh, are you asking uh, what happened in the proceeding brought by the bankruptcy trustee for insurance coverage? Yes, yeah, start with that. Sure. Uh, the, so the bankruptcy proceeding, uh, or the uh, bankruptcy trustee brought a coverage action against Cincinnati Insurance Company um, and several other insurers. Uh, filed a complaint. The complaint was very broad. It sought, it sought insurance coverage for any and all lawsuits brought by former ATI students, such as appellants. Uh, that lawsuit was then settled um, between the bankruptcy trustee on behalf of the insured and uh, it was settled with Cincinnati Insurance Company and Landmark. Those are the two settlement agreements that are in the record. Um, then that settlement was blessed by the bankruptcy court in 1919 order, um, and uh, Cincinnati Insurance Company was under the impression that it had bought peace. Uh, it paid actual money for that, um, and uh, now appellants, as purported judgment creditors, nonetheless seek to assert a claim that the insureds themselves never could because it's been released. Were they given notice and a chance to intervene? Uh, yes. 
Mr. English was, uh, had appeared in the bankruptcy prior to that, um, their counsel, appellant's counsel, and uh, there was no objection to the settlement. All right, counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Your Honors. Um, you're right, uh, Justice, uh, Justice uh, Southwick. Uh, Judge Albright did not have enough facts. Uh, Cincinnati does have to connect the dots. Hamill did. Uh, it was an art articulation of a new remedy uh, to deal with the situation of how you go about and satisfy the adversarial trial requirement. They bring up Essex. Essex is not even close to what this, uh, our situation is. Essex was a case where a plaintiff was suing a defendant and then joining the defendant's insurance company seeking a declaratory judgment on coverage. It's not a situation where, as the status of a judgment creditor, seeking to uh, assert the rights that were articulated in Hamill to meet our burden meet our burden. I mean, uh, we hear a lot about this stuff, but how is it that people in our situation are supposed to access the insurance coverage of a bankrupt insured after they wrongfully breached the duty to defend? And there's no way to get an adversarial trial out of that situation. Um, you know, why did Block say that uh, the uh, the judgment creditors, they, there was an intervention as judgment creditors. No mention of the s &E in the first part of Block where they say how the people got their status. They got their status through a non-adversarial agreed judgment. Why does Hamill equate judgment creditors with s &Es in three different places in the opinion? They never make any distinction whatsoever. You know, what is it about an s &E that affords them the status of uh, going on and getting a Hamill trial and being able to uh, show the adversarial, uh, prove the, meet the adversarial trial requirement. What is it about an assignee? What's so special about an assignee? Is there any danger that exists if a judgment creditor, albeit by a non-adversarial judgment, uh, asserts the same rights as an assignee? All they're trying to do, either one of them, is trying to assert, you know, uh, t tap into the Texas Supreme Court's uh, decision in Hamill. It's a he heads I win, tails you lose proposition from Cincinnati. There is, under Cincinnati's theory of the case, there is, we're just out of luck. We're just, we're just out of luck. And by the way, on, in terms of this release, look at it. The release involves the Dallas action. No mention in the release of the Waco action. No mention of it whatsoever. It involved the Dallas, two Dallas actions and three other actions involving individuals. Those were specifically laid out. There was, it's the not- bankruptcy, In the council, when the bankruptcy proceeding was filed, the trustee then had the power and authority to take the assets of the company, one of which was an insurance coverage and they pursued that. Uh, why isn't that, uh, why, do the, why do individual creditors or, or assinees of the company itself, how do they escape the reach of the bankruptcy? What well, you know, that? the bankruptcy uh, in section 363F has a whole uh, procedure that you go about doing this. Uh, in fact, there's no evidence of uh, compliance with bankruptcy code 363F in terms of that release that you're talking about, let alone conclusive evidence. With uh, 363F, uh, it requires this channeling concept that requires them to show fairness, and it has to, and our people weren't uh, put on notice of anything related to the coverage. The, the coverage actually, the, no, no, in the bankruptcy court, uh, Judge Higginbotham, it dealt with the Dallas action. It didn't deal with the uh, Bartlett action in Waco. It dealt with the Dallas, two Dallas actions and three individuals, none of them from Waco. That is what the, and, and it explains. Well, I, thought, I, thought it was a company. I thought it was a company that went into bankruptcy. Pardon me, sir? I thought the defendant went into bankruptcy. Bankrupt did go into bankruptcy, but the, we're talking about. You mean a particular bankruptcy act? 
the company itself. Online. For all I know, it's still going on, Your Honor. It's uh, the, the stay was lifted in 2019. That's what we were act working on. That's when uh, the, the, the motion to lift the stay, which was heavily opposed by Cincinnati, was lifted, oh, I want to say in the fall of 2019. And that's when we started doing the, the Hamill stuff. That's when we uh, took the steps so that we could be uh, a judgment creditor, so that we would have standing to pursue it. I see my time is up. I thank you very much for your time and attention. All right, counsel, thank you both. <clears throat>